Hello oh guys, uh, today I want to tell you about the secret garden. Sliding down a steep creek side uh, somewhere in western Maybe land, a group of botanists and ecologists are on the hunt. It is a cloudy day in May 2018 and they are searching for an elusive orchard, orchard called the White Lady Slipper. The members of the group have turned off the GPS function on their phones to keep their location secret. This plant is rich, literally off the map, not only because it is real, because, but also because it is highly sought after by all collectors. Uh, the White Lady Slipper is named for its fragile flowers, which vaguely resemble tiny moccasins and have a sweet smell. Much of the orchid's native habitat has been paved over, but it grows freely somewhere in this lush, lush landscape, a preserve over by the nature conservancy. Orchids can be fickle and fascinating plants, and scientists are really only beginning to understand them. Some remain dormant underground for years, presumed dead by those looking for them. Some bloom for only one day each year, and all germinate from seeds as small as dust. Many questions surrounding these plants, including how they will fare in a changing climate, remain unanswered. On the preserve in Maryland, Deborah Lando, an ecologist for TNC, leads a crow that includes Danny Voitem, a botanist at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center down a muddy bank before climbing nimbly up another ridge. Wickham is no stranger to getting his hands dirty in the field. He has devoted much of, this, of his life to studying orchids around the world, uh, tracking them down where they thrive in hard to get to habitats like steamy jungles, swamps and box, often, often tucked into the branches of tall major trees. With an estimate of at least 25,000 species in existence, and new species being discovered regularly, orchids are believed to be the world's most diverse family of flowering plants. Uh, they outnumber all mammals, reptiles, and birds combined, and scientists estimate that they account for about 10% of all flowering plant life on Earth. Uh, but that impressive quantity and diversity have made ensuring that their future a costly challenge of the 200 odd species of is native to North America. More than half are threatened or endangered in some part of their range. Several research endeavors have cropped up in the United States to better understand North America's orchids. The largest among them a nationwide collaboration led by Wickham to build an unfired bank of research. He launched a joint effort in 2012 between the Smithsonian Institution and United States Botanic Garden, called the North American Orchid Conservation Center. The center is working with more than 50 groves and dozens of volunteers to collect samples of every native orchid species in the US and Canada. Each sample gives researchers a chance to better understand how the plants germinate and uh, reproduce. Uh, on 
from this solar cast spring day the orchid hunters are moving one step closer to solving these biological mysteries past an exposure of bedrock beneath a tangle of brush on the cliff side above them they find what they've been looking for the delicate blossoms of the uh, Cepedrium condidium. There's so little known about many orchids, says Wickham. Very few of them have been studied in detail by anybody. The center aims to address that research gap and in the process help scientists who are going to some extreme lands to study this enigmatic plant family. Conserve and restore orchid populations across North America. Orchids begin life as seeds, so um, minor they can only be seen under a microscope. They do not contain any stored food to fuel their growth. Instead, when seeds land in soil or on trees, they rely on a suit of host fungi nearby to supply the nutrients and other resources they require. You are never going to see this fungus unless you are looking at the orchid roots or you are looking into soil with a microscope, says Melissa McCormick, a research scientist at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Enich Wet Water. Maryland, who collaborates with Wickham, that has meant uh, that these orchids and these fungi are very poorly studied and not at uh, a lot has been known about them. That's changing, so as volunteers collect seeds, segments of the plant's fruit and a seedle leaf from native orchids has uh, meant that these orchids and these fungi are very poorly studied <coughs> and not a lot has been known about them. That's, that's, <coughs> that's changing thought as volunteers collect seeds, segments of the plant's fruits and a single leaf from native orchids and send them to the North American Orchid Conservation Center. The leaf tissue stored in a little coin envelopes goes into a genetic bank for DNA research into the plants. Fungi are extracted from the plant roots. The lab grows the fungus in petri dishes, sequences in its DNA and stores it long term in test tubs. Uh, there is so little known about orchids, uh, very few of them has been studied in the detail. The result is a growing body of samples from across the United States and Canada, enough to help researchers study these complex era interrelationships in new ways and learn how to propagate orchids with help from their symbiotic fungi. That research has become even more important as orchids face incre increasing threats. Habitat loss, poaching and deer throwing have reduced orchid numbers. Some species, Wingham says, could become viewable only in botanic gardens, like endangered animals found mostly in those. Even less studied in is how a change in climate will affect these plants. Wetter or drier weather could hurt the fungus in the soil, Wingham says, which could alter an orchid's ability to germinate. Changes in seasonality or phenology could uh, hinder the plant's ability to reproduce the science of seduction. Uh, many orchids achieve 
reproduction by rewarding thirsty pollinators with nectar in return for their pollen delivery services. But about one third of orchids use deceptive strate <coughs> strategies to coax uh, insects or small birds to their flower. This trickery can take many forms. The spider orchid, with its long, lime-like petals and sepals, masqueraders as as a prey of female spider hunter wasps, enticing the insects to to grasp and then sting the spider-shaped flower. Before a fruitless attempt at predation is complete. The wasp bumps into a package of pollen that clings it to, to its head. Uh, some orchids, such as the stream orchid, use a technique called brood site imitation to trick flies into laying their eggs inside the flower. The stream orchid produces a scent that mimics the smell of honeydew. A, lit a liquid produced by a fish. Some flies uh, lay their eggs near a fit nests to give their young a ready meal when they will hatch. In this case, the back of the bamboo with fly schemes of some pollen from inside the flower as the insect exceeds the, the flower. <coughs> In another strategy, called food deception, uh, the pink lady slipper uh, lures a bee to a slit it in its flower pouch by exerting a sweet smell. To escape the pouch, the <coughs> bee must pass under the stigma, a floral, uh, floral reproductive organ and then squeeze through one of two openings, each with a catch of pollen above it that hitches onto the bee's body as it makes it escape. Uh, one study of the early spider orchid uh, found that warm spring temperatures can distract the plant pollinator relationship. The early spider orchid lures young male bees to its flowers by emitting a scent that mimics the sex pheromone of male bees to avoid competing with female bees for the male's attention. The flower needs to bloom after male bees emerge from winter hibernation but before family bees do. Through evolution, these timings have synchronized, Wingham says. But because of climate change, they are getting out of synchrony. Many orchids use pollination strategies like the early spider orchids to lure specific insects or birds with the false promise of food or sex. When the deception results in an encounter, the unwavered pollinator is loaded up with the orchid's genetic material, um, poised to deposit in on the next orchid it visits. But not all pollinator orchid relationships are known. In 2018, Conservation scientist Peter Hulihan and photographer Max Stone uh, set out to get proof of how the ghost orchid, one of the most well-known but instructable flowers on ears, reproduces. It was long believed that the ghost orchid was pollinated by the giant sphinx uh, moose because the insects proboscis or tongue, uh, which can unfurl to twice the length of its body, is designed 
uh, to sip nectar from long tubed flowers like the ghost of or uh, ghost orchid but no one had even photographed the months in action that october stone found himself strapped to a capris tree 50 feet in the air checking a remote camera shining on the largest known ghost orchard the super ghost it's located in the national Audubon society coexque swamp uh, sanctuary in the florida Everglades. Holy hands dropped nearby, <coughs> motioned to stone with his hands, thumbs up, thumbs down. Did stone get the shock? Stone used his phone to snap a photo of the camera screen and sent it to Holy hand, who gaped at what he saw. The photo showed a, showed a mouse interacting with the ghost orchid. Other images showed additional special of mass. Hulihan finally had evidence that the long felt theory that only the gang sphinx pollinated the ghost orchid was wrong. The plant was not variant on a single species of mass. Understanding the orchid's reproductive biology may have been a difficult uh, years old. Uh, years long effort, uh, but preser preserving the ghost might be a smidge easier than anyone had thought possible. Uh, the two celebrated while strapped to the tree. An article followed in the journal Nature. One more orchid mystery put to rest. Kind of. Because even as scientists delighted in the knowledge that the ghost orchid's future was not tied to a single insect, a host of new questions, including whether the giant sphinx actually pollinates the flower or just drink its nectar, unfolded in its wake. There's so much uh, that we don't know, but we know that when orchids show up, we are doing something right. right. Mm, scientists like Hulikan have only begun to unravel the natural history of this waste plant family. In some cases, they are discovering just how resilient orchids can be. On the eastern shore of Maryland, McCormick is studying a, an orchid so rare it was thought to have vanished until it was spotted in 2009 on the Seas Neswango Creek Preserve. Uh, the plant is a hybrid of two orchids that are considered rare in the state, the white fringed and the crested yellow. Uh, Deborah Landau, the TNC ecologist who helps manage the property, considers the reappearance of the orchid a sign of the plant's vigor. Uh, the last recording, recorded sighting of the lemon colored orchid had been 18 years earlier, just after a wildfire burned through the landscape. There had been no sign of the plant since, until, until suddenly, after controlled burns, the plant was spotted thriving on a former loblolly pine plantation that had been clear-cut and then restored to ecological health. It's just crazy to think that these plants aren't exact factors, says Lando. But we do a fire and boom. When the right conditions are there, they come back. It just gives me a lot of hope. McCormick, along with a postdoctoral fellow in her lab, Ida Harry is trading hybrid orchid from Naswango Creek and other landscape, uh, landscapes, including TNC's Green Swamp Preserve in North Carolina. 
dialogue analysis, among other things, how orchid hybrids form and how and what hybrids suggest about the development of new species. Okay, guys, that's it for today. Uh, wish you a good day and uh, goodbye.